Once upon a time, in a place of carved stone faces, a monster ate a tremendous meal. Its belly was so full that it could not move, so it slumbered. When the monster had digested, it awoke. It raised its curious head into the wind and smelled the despair of people stirring somewhere in the unbroken darkness. The monster licked its blood-caked snout and set off to investigate. The monster walked unhurried through the darkness, following the scent. It grew hungrier and hungrier as the scent got stronger. Its powerful heart pounded with joy as it came upon the great chest. The box reeked with a delicious promise. The monster greedily nosed it open. How delectable they would be if only their organs were bursting with fear. The monster toyed with its morsels, tasting their terror-tinged sweat as they skittered between its great big teeth. It laughed as they tickled it with their scrabbling hands, climbing to escape. There was one mouthful that did not taste of terror. She was not tender with despair. She reached between the monster's grasping fingers and freed a shard of stone. She took a deep breath and bellowed into the darkness, hoping her cries would reach someone. Somewhere in a place of stone faces, people raised a lantern to illuminate their doom. They knew they could not survive, yet they struggled just the same. These are the ones that taste best, thought the monster, delighted. Hello and welcome to The Last Standy, a board game podcast coming to you from the Plain of Stone Faces, the Abyssal Woods, the Rust Ocean and the Inverted Mountain. I'm your host Fen and I'm joined here today by Alexis. From the Rust Oceans, hi. Alessio. From a point in the centre of the Abyssal Woods, hi. Audrey. From the Sacred Pood and eating dessert, hi. And Kara. I have no idea where I am, but hi. <laughs> Lost in the darkness. And uh, from myself, Fen, hello. Uh, we go. This is a, a big one. And because it's a big episode, we're going to be skipping the standy catch-up, although I imagine a lot of it will just be talking about the subject of this recording, which you should already have figured it out. But if you don't, it is Kingdom Death's Gambler's Chest expansion. Now, this is going to be a little bit different to our normal recordings. Um because we wanted to structure things in a way that would um, allow for people to have a listen if they're not aware of what is in the gambler's chest. And then we could have a little bit of a spoiler discussion following that, where we'll talk through about the first third or so of the campaign. So for those of you who want to know what's happening, our first portion is going to be about the physicality of the box, inserts, settlement box, miniatures, that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, I will be policing it. So if anyone starts uh, spoiling, uh, wandering into recording, it's going to be me going la 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 or something similar to force it to be cut. So we promise you no spoilers, nothing that you wouldn't read in the front section of the book or see in the box when you open it up. Um, and then in the second half, we're going to walk through the first portion of the campaign and we're just going to chat about the stuff that is as we all individually unlocked it as we got to it. Um, so that will be up until the f new first new nemesis that is in the gambler's chest, which is the gigantic jolly old Santa Claus. But anyway, hello everyone. Hi. So gambler's chest. Um, who wants to grab on initial thoughts and feelings of when they opened the box? Um, I'm going to throw Kara under the bus because you opened it most recently. <laughs> <laughs> I can see it opened right behind you. <clears throat> yeah, uh, I... I opened it, what, a week ago or so? Um, hasn't been too long. Um, initial thought when I opened it. Um, similar excitement to when I first opened KDM Core Box with higher quality. So really, that was like one of the first things I thought when I opened it. I, I have to say I had a lot of reservations. That's why I waited so long to open it at all. And uh, when I opened it, I really thought, hey, this looks like an improvement. Just straight up. Um, the insert, while I, 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 I believe many people still don't like it, it's with all game inserts, uh, most people um, get their own custom things, but... We'll talk about the inserts, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's more thought out than the original in the core box. Um, that's definitely the case um yeah the one thing i i thought badly about was why new card sizes <laughs> that's yeah 
please don't talk about that. <laughs> Why new card sizes without the sleeve sizes for them? Yeah, well, the sleeve sizes are coming on the store and they will be purchasable separately. I have checked that with Adam uh, and I think Paladin sleeves have already released a size. Uh, not that I could get my hands on them anyway. I'm going to wait for Adam's um, sleeves. Uh, but yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, um, it is. It's a bit weird that they're not like tarot card sized because that would have been a established size that um, would prominently feature the new art. Um they do look gorgeous. I, I yeah. My do... first thought when I got my first thought when I got my box was like, yeah, I'm finally going to use these sleeves that I've been storing for three <laughs> years, four years, and I still need more. Ah. I do think that a higher quality is going to be a recurring theme of the the gambler's chest uh, discussion. Um, with some caveats. That's, that's, <laughs> with some caveats, but I think that it's. Um, <laughs> It does feel a lot more polished than the the base game in term, uh, e even just in term of uh, physicality. The thing that uh, I I think is the the lowest point of the the GC in uh, in a term of just the, the physical box and items is that Adam still doesn't seem to be able to get the cards back uh, color right. Um, there's still a lot of issues, especially since all of the uh, beta patterns card, uh, their back like doesn't fit uh, the the way that it it's it's working, and so it's kind of wonky. Uh, that kind of immediately um, empers a little bit the the look uh, of the game, which the rest of it is kind of stunning. Um, yeah, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I've had additional problems with the cards that I've um, talked about a bit on on my um, on my community Discord. Um, so I'm somebody who grew up like doing lots of magic tricks. I love card tricks. I still love handling cards and, and everything, shuffling them and that, which we've chatted about in the past in some of the recordings. Um, so my first playthrough with the gambler's chest was marred by the fact that I unconsciously cut to the weighted cards. The new card stock is, I have like 1.31 and 1 1.5 yeah. and 1.6 cards all mixed in with my stuff. And the new cardstock is so much thicker and so has it's such a higher quality, which is they great. show from yeah. a side, yeah. yeah. No, 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 not even showing from the side. I will cut them to repeatedly. Like my campaign has had like there's about five or six think I think new uh, settlement events that go into the settlement event deck. I had basically those for over seventy five percent of my starting um, campaign like run i kept hitting the same things over and over and it wasn't until i started like looking at it and i had to change my shuffle um to deal with that uh it's i guess it's the issue of like changing quality there's the same thing i'd say with the um narrative narrative models that my only complaint about them is i wish they were like this from the beginning um because the older stuff doesn't like look as anywhere near as good um, the new models, the new sculpt, they're, they're literally like 45 mil size, these um, Survivor miniatures, and I think they're gorgeous. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh, the, the uh, Atnes looks amazing. The Croc, the Smog Singers, I hate the Smog Singers so much. I just loathe <laughs> them, which is exactly what you're supposed to do. So it's such a competent form of modeling. I hate their smoke. You want to grab your no. Smog Singer, and if you take it from the top, or even while gluing it, you are very likely to break at least one of the smokes. Yeah, ah! I, I, I ended up running a metal pin through the inside of each one to try and give it a bit more support, but I did break one to the point I had to rebuild the the nipple. <laughs> that's, a, that's not a sentence I thought I'd be saying today. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, I will... like. I, I will say like I'm good I'm overwhelmingly positive about the gambler's chest and I do have some nitpicks and as we're talking about that here's my biggest nitpick when it comes to the physicality of the whole thing I can live with like the cards and I can live with the insert I think the insert's like mostly fine I think the settlement box needed a space for settlement locations but otherwise it's it's great um, I would I really hope they sh ship them separately because it's really nice to just pack it pack the settlement away all in one thing um or even keep it in there while playing but my biggest disappointment was the king which oh. it is it is a 2013 sculpt and do not get me wrong i love thomas david's work but i really think he should have been given a chance to go back and 
and and update this um, because it just shows its age in its size in the quality. I've got I've got the resin king. I've got two plastic kings already. This one is exactly the same as the two plastic kings. Just like I I just got the same king three times, um, and that was my biggest disappointment. But I I guess I, like the crimson crocodile is one of my favorite sculpts of all time. Um, Atnus is amazing. The smog singers, which I finished painting this morning, um, the armor set I should say is my favorite Kingdom Death armor set. Um, the physicality of all of this is is absolutely fantastic. Um, even the rule book. Um, all I could say is I wish I had more ribbon bookmarks <laughs> because I could do with about four, four or five. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But they put them in there, which is super useful. Um, and for the most part, I found the layout in it really good. But um, let's let's see what uh, who wants to go next on how they feel about their you know opening process and setting up the first campaign and everything. Well, there's one thing uh, we can talk a little bit about the the inserts. Uh, there's one insert that I think is uh, really really amazing, and that Adam can uh, be proud of that one. It's the settlement insert uh, that has been like really a boon uh, for setting up and playing the game. Uh, I feel like that's something that was missing from the uh, the first iteration of Kingdom Death, and in the GC, it kind of shined through the the play that we had at Audrey's and a little bit that I played at my own, uh, own place. I don't yeah. know if uh, uh, other people feel about uh, agreed. it. Agreed. It, it, it's great and you can take it out of the box and get more space in the box or keep it into the box because you are traveling. It's you, you have different uses to get for this box. You can still organize it a bit however you want. Um, and yeah, I think it's really an amazing thing. Did uh, did you guys I, I notice the really neat bit where the largest um, terrain tiles go into the main insert underneath the settlement box? I was like, that's really cool. It just it has a little indented area in the plastic insert in the main box, and that's for like the the really large terrain tiles like the blood pool. You just taught it to me. <laughs> I was looking. I was like. Where, do I, where am I supposed to put these two large, like, three by three terrain tiles? And then I was looking at the bottom of the insert, and I was like, they fit in there, and they there's a raised area to protect them, and then the box goes on top. And I was like, now that's the kind of thing I really appreciate. And that's, at that's the, at nice. the same time, since I, oh my since gosh, I have right. the... the... <laughs> <laughs> since I, Just since I have, for you. Since I have the Xelazer ins insert for, for a long time, I didn't, let's say, have to think too long about that yeah. and just... Stuck it into the core box. I've got them in with my main uh, tray that holds all the terrain as well. Yeah, but I was just like, that is, that's the kind of touches I really like. Um, like the flip side of that is the small little well that you put the encounter cards in because they're very, they're mini American. Mm. It's, uh, it, it's just too, not quite deep enough. Um, yeah. So they sit a little bit too high in there. But it, it, there's definitely been a lot of thought going into this for sure. Yeah, my, my main gripe with it, uh, which is the same with actually lots of game inserts in general, is that they are made to accommodate uh, sleeved cards. Okay, cool. But then, in this specific kind of games with huge rule books, they forget that, yeah, if you have sleeved cards, your rule book still has to go somewhere and not be put on the cards. And here it's definitely not fair um i i think of Aaron trespass which has smaller books so i mean that it's a bit different because the books are smaller they do not have the thick cover so they take much less space but they have a space in the insert on top of it so that you can store them there and they will not risk damaging anything by being put on that and with have gained death the book being so huge and that stands both for the core box and for the gambler chest yeah, that's that's huge, and there is always that photo. Yeah, but my cards are going to bend a little bit. The dividers are going to bend a little bit, uh, and I love the dividers. I I, I love this part of um, the game. Uh, it, it's it's a simple thing. I just wish the gear dividers would be just a little bit smaller, so that for the people that use uh, penny sleeves. Um, pages and stuff like that, uh, we could put these uh, into it instead of having to cut them. Um, but yeah, my, my main issue is with the 
book and not being able to get it back properly into the into the insert wi without damaging cards. And one of the things that I loved when doing the setup was even if we were trying not to read stuff, you couldn't help but notice all the drawings, all the illustrations, and these new settlement heavens are so pretty, so pretty. The few ones that have like big pictures, oh, they're so beautiful. Yeah, the rule book's the same. The illustrations in that, that's uh, like, oh, yeah. they've always had a few of the fun little um, like comedy ones, like the... Um, I think they're all drawn by Lockman Lang with like the white line pointing at the Alistair survivor and for priority target stuff. But they've gone, they've gone way above. I think the one um, I can't find the page right now, but I really loved is when it's talking about the new collective cognition survivors. And it shows a group of collective cognition survivors walking past an old survivor. And it's the two Lucys doing Spider-Man pointing at each other. And behind them, they both have illustrations of their respective um, yes. settlement yes. sheets, mm -hmm. which uh, survivor sheets, which I was like, oh, that is really cool. And there's tons of those in there. These <clears throat> fun little um, snippets, and and some of them are serious, some of them are super goofy. Uh, it really encapsulates the 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 game as a whole. Yeah. Speaking of uh, illustration, I think that the fact that all of the philosophy books are illustrated by different artists that all manage to fit into uh, a journal. Uh, artistic team but all still have their own uh, personality I think that that's just wonderful uh, opening okay, each yeah. uh, philosophy book just brings my brings me joy <laughs> yeah about the illustration Adam had the commission a lot of them as we know from the long wait they are all there, they're beautiful. And speaking of exactly one, the one where it talks about the roles, you can see the famous entities of KDM playing. Do you think that the one to the left is the goblin? Um, I, I took that as, as being the gambler, but it could be. Uh, it, it, it could, it be, could, could but it should have one eye on that side. I don't, don't remember. Don't know actually. It doesn't seem li like double chinned. Yeah. Who who knows? Who knows? That is. It's it's a fun. It, it's making for great content for an audio medium. <laughs> anyway, I, I have a couple of considerations that I think I must put here before it's too late, and we move on. So uh, about the insert, I have. Uh, uh, it's a mixed bag of exceptionally good and exceptionally bad, which is astounding, actually. Uh, the insert all, uh, all together is beautiful and usable, and I'm still using it. But uh, there are considerations already, Audrey said that, but the dividers uh, are all over uh, the... Uh, are higher than the cards, and then you put the books over there, and that's a big problem that... Uh, was exactly the same of the original insert in the original KDM. At least there, you you could just raise a bit the edges to put the board on top of them, uh, and then use it to put the books. But you cannot do that here, and it's impossible that the the real really the only one real gripe with the original insert is still there, a bit worse if possible. Uh, all the content fit fits sleeved inside the box so it's great but it's kind of a shame that i have a box that size with that height of the box and i cannot put uh, more stuff into it because it barely fits basically when uh, new content arrives i'll probably be able to fit another expansion in there but that's it not more I love the way a lot of consideration has been put into making the stuff uh, a bit reason so that you can pick the cards easily and the rest. I love that you can uh, basically have sleeved cards standing in, almost in place without slipping everywhere because you have uh, the, the ground with uh, that kind of uh, rise and lows, rise and lows. And uh, there is a there has been a lot of consideration and love in it. Uh, it's beautiful that it has the same module modulus of the um, of the original box, so that you can put basically parts of the 
inserts are ready, you, you already have and still fit uh, inside. But then the, the settlement box, which is a nice, exceptionally good addition, is uh, out of that modules, modulus, so you, you don't fit exactly everything perfectly if you try to go hybrid uh, with storage. And it's all like this, exceptionally good, exceptionally bad. <laughs> everything like that so that's basically it I, I think I love it and I'm still using it I don't want to throw away a perfectionally functionable insert but uh, it will probably need improvement as, lo as soon as uh, it will live as long as uh, campaigns of that it's because after that I have to reorganize stuff I would also have preferred if the slot for the philosophy booklets were was a little bit bigger because no. right now going with the figures... No, you, you are moving that around. Yeah, the booklets are a problem. The booklets are a problem, yeah. Yeah, well, um, we could probably fill another hour talking about just the physicality and I'm sure we'll yeah, come exactly. back to oh, yes. here and there as we go. But um, we're going to first of all take a little look through the uh, various other bits and pieces of the rule book to continue a, a spoiler-free look at things. Um, so... Very brief. Uh, how did you guys feel about the new like core rules, which is specifically for the monsters of the synchronic synchronic attack, vibration damage, and the repeat mechanism? Um, which is synchronic attack is is like where multiple survivors will be hit by the same attack. Vibration damage is mostly used by the smog singers. It's an unusual form of damage, and repeat is like a new version of durations. Yeah, I think that repeat is a cleaner version of duration cards uh it it feels like it clicks with the game a little bit better um same with the synchronistic attack i don't really see it as a, a change in mechanic but rather just a simplification so that you don't have to do as many rolls as you would usually do uh, all of that just plays well and feels feels like very nice to play uh, I also have to say that uh, I admire vibration damage as a mechanic because, of course, it's extremely damaging, but it's very smart. Because when... Uh, actually, it, this is spoiler-free, so uh, I just say that... I'll just say that uh, if you have a monster with a stat line unimpressive, but you give it just one point of speed more with vibration damage, that could be very nasty. And that's smart. Yeah, I really liked um, Synchronic Attack in particular. I thought that one is, um, it, yeah, as you say, it simplifies uh, the, um, the whole like process of attacking multiple survivors. I th thought as well it was it's employed in some really fun fashions, and I think the Crimson Crocodile, when we talk about that, does a great showcase of what what you can do with that kind of mechanic. So I look forward to seeing more of it going ahead. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The, when we will spoil stuff, uh, there's a lot of stuff to say about this, especially repeat AI. So. <laughs> there's also the terrified mechanic, which is specifically in the Crimson Croc uh, fight, but it also appears in a couple of other places in the in the GC. I don't know if that's going to appear in other monsters, but at least in the GC, um, I've seen it in a in a couple of showdowns. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll talk about that one um, with the Crimson Croc. Oh, for yeah. sure. One thing there, I, I really find weird in the Gambler's Chest um, when we talk about components. Um, I mean, one new thing everyone knows about, I'm pretty sure that's not a spoiler, is the scout system. So you can have five survivors in the showdown. Why do, do we still only get four status cards? That is a yeah. great yep. question. No, that, that was on my list of things I was going to be talking about when we got to the Crimson Crocodile. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's <laughs> not, not only that, but um, we don't even get like a fifth card for the Phoenix. The Phoenix is a core part of this campaign and he, like Spiral Age is a constant thing during that fight and everybody Bloody has ends. a card. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's so... Um, it's dreaded decade, I think the actual card's called. Uh, yeah, that I agree, Gara. I agree. I was, and I think other people have noted it elsewhere. For the sake of printing half a dozen more cards per box, it is noticeable, um, and it's it's a bit 
off to have to have like your scout and be like okay well i'll use this little bit of the scout board to track these tokens and try and remember or or whatever yeah it's um yeah definitely well, a, a miss yeah it, it's very strange that it's not there because um uh, you, you say that it's uh, the the scout is optional but the scout is pretty much there for every fight because playing without it is like not really an option that is offered by the game that's uh, something that we'll talk about later i'm sure yeah we, we, we will definitely get to that but beforehand um uh, go on uh, I, I was just going to to ask before we go into more spoilery territory why don't we just uh say how we felt about the gc in general before like with that, the what we played so far that's the structure we've got here um <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> so yeah we've got more we've got more to talk about you can you can see it i think we um, are in step three now <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're about to go into the just a brief um, thoughts on this new campaigns, nodes, and pillars system, and then like thoughts about how the gambler's chest is constructed. The people of the Dreamkeeper. So, um, for those of you who are not familiar, uh, Kingdom Death originally just kind of had monsters that turned up a certain lantern years, and people we all referred to them just by like this is a lantern year one monster, this is a lantern year two monster, and then we get to around lantern year seven and be like well they're turning up all at different years but i guess they're roughly around the range same strength uh, that was codified into these nodes and you get a section talking about building your campaign and it's like giving um it gives you the nodes for all the monsters it also has this thing which i think was quite nice of giving people certain roles within a campaign construction and play and saying like you're handling this you're handling that except um, for the builder role i don't really get it. like they build all the miniatures at the start and then they are done i mean the the role set says up showdown repairs as well so i'm wondering what happens in adam's play test oh oh route. no no um i've got i've got um the uh the, the death king narrative um sculpts on my desk right now that i've had to repair already so okay <laughs> okay yeah yeah <laughs> it does happen. i we... We, I, I we had a smoke signal what, break during our game, so I'm sure that's a common occurrence. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah I, think, actually, I think mostly it's a role for the owner. Yeah, no, the, 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 the real stuff is the Phoenix Whiskers. That's the entire reason why I stopped knocking down the miniature. As a little aside, I've got... I still five, have not yeah. fully built my I've, Phoenix. I've got, the Whiskers I've, are still off. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was going to get to. I've got five Phoenixes and i got three sets of Phoenix Whiskers. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i don't even know how i have five i shouldn't have five um but i found one in a box like fully assembled and i was like where's this one come from i don't know i don't remember uh but yeah yeah anyway um i i this no i like the node system um and i like this cat the concept they've gone with of adding like complexity points to help you try and understand how um how much cognitive load is involved with the various different bits and pieces. Um, I would like to point out that I do not think Node 4 is right. Yeah. And Node it, 4 it's... is... No, Node 4 is apparently the Dung Beetle Knight, the Lion God, and the King. You know what? I'll give you that the Dung Beetle Knight and the Lion God sit around the same power level. The King uh, turns up in, like, the final third of your campaign and... Why is it not Node 5? Well, I, I, I'm fine with them splitting the Dung Beetle Knight away from the Phoenix, Dragon King, Sunstalker. It does step up in difficulty, and it does have a very challenging level 3 fight. Sweet. But they... Uh, no. What are they doing in the same category as the King? Not... Unless they're changing them in campaigns of death, which well, I'd be fine with. There's probably going to be some change in the campaigns of death, because it very much feels like they thought about the node system way later and are now trying to retrofit the old monster into it um i mean that's that's literally what happened but it, it's it feels very much like uh like it and like there wasn't a, a precise node design for all of the the monster and maybe in cod we'll see some improvement um similarly you have the option to play with the different systems added by the gc uh, that they call pillars uh into other uh, into other campaigns they say like uh, adding the encounters or just the scout or just the philosophies uh, or philosophies and knowledge uh, into another campaign but at the moment because we are lacking uh, monster specific uh, philosophy or interactions I don't feel it's 
really doable and i really hope that uh cod when it comes out hopefully next year uh will have better integration with the uh, um the uh, advanced kdm system uh, i'm doing air quotes here yeah i i think it's fair to say i appreciate them taking the time to say here's how you can start building a campaign and um uh, team death have been very much like oh this is your game we want you to build it and play it the way that you want to play and experience it which is it's really sweet that's like yeah that's that's true that's what i've tried to um uh, preach as gospel over the years is ultimately it's your game and you choose how you want to interact with it uh, so i think it's a nice really nice concept um but let's see as we're on this and let's look at this next bit this is the big chunk which is our dear friend collective cognition and the arc survivors and philosophies and knowledge now we'll probably be mentioning a few here and there while we talk about the spoiler section but um how do you guys feel about this system as a whole okay uh love it in short words but okay no love it and uh, this is the way kingdom that should be played actually of course it ca comes with a cost um, i am not one to use uh, apps as, as you probably know uh, for kingdom death i like the bookkeeping i was used to it so it's not a big overload for me because i used to record the movement the the die rolls and so on and it's not a lot but i i think compared to the standard campaign that the quantity of bookkeeping i i can see with uh, i have solo sessions and group sessions i usually record everything in solo session to not make errors and the group session I make a mess uh, it was weird when I noticed that in three people in a group session we took basically the same time I took to uh, to, to, to play to, to set up for a hunt uh, the same time I took to do that alone recording everything so it adds a lot of bookkeeping, but I agree that in this case this is a necessary evil because that's really the way the game should be played. I love the way it works. Even Voltless. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, <coughs> I mean, generally, I first of all, I love the knowledge system. I love it way yeah. more than fighting arts. It's, it's really a part... I mean... One thing that always intrigued me about King of Monster is this concept of, hey, I have this rudimentary settlement that develops. And I think the knowledge system adds a lot to that uh, in a very um, small, steppy way, um, so to say. Yeah, you know, people make experiences, uh, advance what the settlement knows, and um, later survivors can... Uh, build on that um, so hey you made some experiences so I don't have to do them anymore I can profit from them which I really love um, the philosophy system I mean it's kind of the, the, the framework to, for you to get knowledges I I don't know I feel like um, first of all the, the philosophies are very different in their usability like every philosophy has this um, negative um i, I forgot that is <coughs> i forgot how it's called um um neurosis yeah neurosis a tenant in a neurosis yeah and yeah in one case basically when a survivor got their philosophy i knew okay you won't come with me anymore because i can't use you anymore and um, and that sucks. And there is, I mean, I, I, I spoiled <laughs> myself. I flipped through the book. There's no way to get rid of it. Yeah. And maybe you should cut this for other people who don't want to. No, they don't can get rid of the neurosis. <laughs> <laughs> but no, that, that that that's that's fun. That's fun. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, that's a part I don't like. Um, there are minor gripes I have with the whole system like um, when you improve a knowledge 
um, the improved knowledge gets added to your settlement. If uh, another survivor would get this knowledge, they get the improved version. But if a survivor already has the knowledge in the not improved version, it doesn't get improved. And that's, for example, something I, I dislike. Why, why can't the survivors, you know, sit together during the settlement phase and talk about what they experience and, oh, hey, yeah, that's a good idea. Maybe I should do this. And now the survivor also has to, the other one also has the better version. Um, that's something I would like to see. Um, but yeah, apart from that, love the knowledge system, great stuff, more of that. Yeah, uh, li likewise, I, I, I like the concept of it. Uh, I don't like this kind of, yeah, sometimes you're like, yeah, the survivor becomes useless. Uh, I like the fact that it adds other stuff beyond stats and maybe permanent injuries that really make you say, oh, I'm going to go into this direction with this survivor and make this one a tank or make this one a support because it fits with that and it's and it replaces the fighting arts in that point we were with the philosophy you get knowledges that go in the same direction so you have something that is more coherent that is more constructed than the fighting arts however in my opinion the way that the fighting arts are handled they have evolved less is awful not yeah not not not, not that Oh, of course, you you would have to do something, but something something different because there you feel like you have all these cards and you're going to open a table, make a dice roll with little to no chance to get it. I mean, at that point, just get it off and say every time you are instructed to draw a fighting arts, do something else. I don't know what, but something Pay else. Pay a loony to get a fighting art or don't get it. For yeah. example, I, I think they really overcorrected um, because they. Like, you can get a secret, one secret fighting art, and you don't have to vault, bother with vaultless for secret fighting art. And you can only get one um, fighting art. And I think that's, like, considering you've got then three knowledges, that's absolutely fine. But I, I totally get what you're saying. So far, to date, I have managed um, to lock in two fighting arts. Um, and one of those was the strain fighting art Giant's Blood. Um, I even unlocked uh, Infernal Rhythm, and then I was really sad as it crumbled to dust. And I was like, but... But it, this is this is the this is the monster for infernal rhythm. This is the music. Why? Why? Um, although I, you know, I kind of, so I don't know. I think I might. I'm going to try playing a run through People of the Lantern with collective cognition. But I am just going to skip on Voltless and follow the strict limits of one and one just to see how it feels. I'm not a big proponent of house rules. Um, but I think that one might just be a bit more fun. Um, it may be because I'm my, music's my favourite thing in the game and I'm sad that Infernal Rhythm went off into the deck and I won't see it again. I, I, got, I got Devil's Melody just because it keeps getting proposed to me at the end of a showdown. So. <laughs> I, 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 I understand that Yeah, if you get too many fighting guards, blah, 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 it's going to get too easy and the balance is going to get thrown off. But in a campaign where the butcher features not being able to try and get legendary lungs and relying on two no, no, extremely no, Audrey, hard... Uh, Audrey, it's a secret fighting art. That's not a problem. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah true. Yeah. It's a secret yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. yeah sorry. <laughs> that's, that's fine. Sorry. I get the gist of, of your issues and I have had similar ones. I actually think just one fighting art is really interesting, though. I think that's cool. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, also, only, the only problem uh, is that it's... It's a too much of a gamble to get one. Like you, you getting more torment and uh, systemic pressure is a huge cost. Yeah, I I think anyway that, uh, and you are not assured that it will work anyway. But uh, uh, I I think that to answer to properly discuss this, we we will need to get spoiler a bit. So. Anyway, uh, one thing I can say without spoiling, I, I think that the entire system with collective cognition and the settlement location tied to that, it's actually what I would, and the way you can have, you can uh, actually uh, get new knowledges and so on, that's the way I would have wanted to, to be the innovation system. Yeah, for myself... This was the system I was most concerned about because it is 
taking an entirely separate system and grafting it onto a game that was functioning perfectly well without it, uh, so uh, this was the one I was most concerned about, I can say I think that this is one of the best things about the Gambler's Chest, for absolutely sure. It's really, really good, even if initially at least it is a lot to take in and, and handle and deal with. Um, no, best thing, best thing is the Crimson Call of Dale, so... Oh, Atlas! Atlas is my favorite that, nemesis now. That that's actually something that I I wanted to uh, to bring up. Uh, how do we all feel about the absolute overload of information that comes in on year, uh, let's say just one through three? Uh, like the <laughs> I I thought that year one was way too overwhelming way too many new systems introduced all at the same time and i get that it's it's how it's supposed to be because you know you do you have all of those new systems that needs to be added to the game but uh it's it made year one feel like a, a bit of a, a cognitive overload uh at least on uh, our end i feel i mean for me personally the cognitive aspect was fine i i even the whole philosophy system and getting the booklets and having different events and what I, I think that's fine. What I kind of disliked, I set up the game, I played a prologue and then I felt like, okay, I'm setting up the game again. And now I'm setting it up again because um, just so much stuff was added. And um, so it took quite a while until I had a feeling. So, okay, I think now I actually have everything I need for this campaign on the table. Um, but I guess in a second playthrough, that's better because you know what to no, expect. No, it will take an hour. <laughs> yeah, but, but, an hour but, anyway. but just you, you know what to expect. So um... yeah. I, I almost feel like there should have been a big disclaimer at the start of this saying, hey, uh, before you jump into the People of the Dreamkeeper, you might want to play a normal People of the Lantern campaign with these, um, mod these nodes, these... Um, pillars and these bits and pieces because the, the pe like uh, yeah i i would not recommend jumping into people of the dream keeper for someone who hasn't like played quite a fair bit oh, beforehand because no. it is mm -hmm. there is a, a lot and there's a lot of expectations that you at least have got the basics down so you can handle the new stuff um yeah. and and i mean even when you are used to playing kgm you may still mess up rules playing the gambler's chest i don't know but we are going to roll back on that crack level three <laughs> yeah. when when we discovered that we messed up uh, yeah. we are going to roll that back yeah um okay yeah so uh speaking of new systems and things patterns so we've seen patterns creeping in for a while we've had a bunch of them uh this is the first proper big thing we've gotten two sets indomitable patterns which come for level three versions of the monsters and they're like prestige equipment and then the seed pattern system um so yep how do people feel about about patterns either kind i I'll I'll start if uh, everybody is fine with that. Um, I really did not like. No, the no, seed you don't patterns. get to go first. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, <laughs> carry on. Uh, I really did not enjoy the seed patterns because it feels way too random and it requires you to spend quite a bit of resources to to try to unlock them. And the problem is that because the pattern deck uh, deck is so big and there's not a good way to control it. Uh, whenever we drew something, it was either something that would have been useful a few lantern years before or will only be useful like 10 years lenders here in the future. And we never really yeah. drew something that we looked at and were like, oh, this fits where we are at the game right now. And this would be like an addition to one of our character. Every time it feels it felt like either something that was extremely niche that we don't didn't need or something that, you know, uh, we we got I think something that we could craft with um we got like an upgrade on some gear for some uh, bone gear I think that would have been fine mm. but we the were axe, already on axe, weapon craft. an axe I think the axe I, I think have was opinions. the one that was good uh, that was good for right now though that that that's like the first good one that we drew I think but yeah stuff like that so I've got a this is I was thinking about this this morning and this is um this is what popped into my head. And I don't think it's a big change. How would you feel if you set up your pattern deck and you excluded all monster specific ones and they get shuffled in on the introductory event for that particular monster? 
that would probably be a good upgrade. It's like the era. Okay, I have opinions. And uh, th there might be also something to do with like tiers, which would add more bootkeeping and so being a mess. But like uh, at some point, you take the lower tier patterns out of the deck. Like I don't know, every ten lantern yards, j just do it twice in a campaign. But so that you do not risk like getting something which is for a very early piece of gear that you just. You don't, don't give a fuck about it do now. Do you know what my first pattern card was? It requires king materials. Yeah, <laughs> they, my, mine too. <laughs> we got something that required um, late phoenix material, and then we got the um, um, the Masamune, I think. Yeah. And and then we drew something that we drew like the gambler's masks or something like that. Something that was the, like, the, good the, for uh, true. The sci-fi eye advisor we got. Oh yeah, we already got later. We, we I got mean, that later too. I, I, I only, I've, uh, disclaimer, I only played the four, first four Lantern years of the campaign. I only got one seed pattern. Um, technically, it's probably the one that's most easily to craft early on because um, it just changes a piece of gear you start the campaign with. And I was really excited. Oh, cool, seed pattern. You let's learn it. Oh, stone. sounds interesting. And um, I will never craft this shit. <laughs> you got I, I got that yeah. one as I got that one as well. We can talk about it when we get to the dandelion section it's, of the. It, yeah, it, it yeah, was yeah. really disappointing. And, <laughs> and it, anyway, I, and I, also I, so, some some of the I I don't think it's in the seed patterns, but like if you introduce promo patterns and stuff, some of them require survivors with fighting arts. Not a yeah. lot, but some of them. The, there is, ah! Yeah, there's that problem. There's the problem that the patterns, like um, the existing ones, have black backs. These new ones have orange. Some of them even are seed patterns, and they have black backs. And if you try running both systems, uh, you get a seed pattern and a pattern every time someone hits insight because both. Like it seems like the older pattern stuff needs to have a uh, an update um, to bring it all in line. But the system as a whole, I like. I think it's fun. It just you could do is some more refining and tuning to give it a bit more focus. Yeah, I I have opinions about that, and I will state them now. I think. Okay, go ahead. You will have your opinions, and then we're going to yeah. talk about the scouts before yeah. we get onto oh, oh, oh. timeline. Yeah, sure. Oh, oh. Opinion is that I got disenamored with uh, patterns uh, as a concept in these kind of games because you uh, each pattern is basically a settlement location with added requirements so uh, there's uh, since you have settlement location with other requirements okay it's fun to have one or two a couple or some but make it a system is completely unjustified or at, at least uh, it works as long as you uh, try to lie to yourself that this is just a mini settlement location, basically. And uh, this is personal because my campaign is currently on Lantern Year 13 and I have uh, Collective Toil, uh, Product Young, a lot of Tinkers, five survivors returning, and, some, and a lot of times five, five, survi five, survivor, five survivors there, graves and so on. I get tons of endeavors and actually uh, have a deck that you can basically got uh, drained uh, real, real soon is exactly like heavy having them in locations so it's not for all uh, but i actually uh, this is a complaint and not a complaint but it is more tied to the way you have to select uh, uh, principles in this uh, in this campaign specifically uh, with philosophies but we will talk about that later but anyway uh, I don't think that patterns are that useful. They are a nice touch of color, but they are too many to actually be just seen as nice. Just to be clear, you mean seed patterns? Because if you were saying yeah, about, seed like, patterns, seed patterns, 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 of course, I yeah, yeah. Because indomitable yeah. patterns are amazing. It's yeah, such a of good course, thing. So, some patterns and some stuff is amazing, and that's nice. It's still mini settlement location, but they have requirements, so they 
that's funnier, it's, but seed patterns are useless. It's not a, uh, mini, actually, it's not a yeah. mini settlement location in the case of Indomitables, it's just an extra bit stuck yeah. onto the existing one. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, we, yeah. We, 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 yeah. We could talk about that when we discuss... It's a gigacatarium. The, the second set, it's second a giga. Um, yeah, it is. A gigacatarium, sure. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Right, um, okay, so scouts. Uh, how do people feel about Scouts. Oh wait! Before we, um, oh, I, I, on. one thing regarding collective cognition, I'm not sure if if you counted a spoiler. I just say it, then you can tell me. Um, <clears throat> weapon proficiency. I played yeah. four lantern years, and I haven't started a single weapon proficiency yet uh, because uh, I can't, and that sucks. <laughs> I like it actually. So <laughs> I like collective cognition, but I feel like that's not there. great. You're, you're nearly there, Kara. I know I'm so. nearly there. Yeah. I, I looked ahead, but it's... <laughs> <laughs> it's in the rule book, so it's not really spoiling. It's spelled out in the rule book. <clears throat> yeah, I, it's just the number, but you can get there. <laughs> I personally think that it's a good way to try to push the player towards. Um, knowledge cards and philosophies and to worry less about uh, weapon proficiency at the start um yeah it's a bit weird not to be able to do it for like, quite sometimes at the start um yeah it's it good is. pacing actually i like it yeah. yeah um it's it's fair i had the simple thing of being like oh come on this is taking forever but um uh, we 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 have time. Uh, it's not time is not our friend. So last bit of the non spoiler <laughs> section. How do people feel about the scout system in general? Um, and I'm going to go first here because this is the one part of the game that I don't think I'm going to use in the future. So yeah. um, I, I will use it if I'm playing like with four other people and they need a fifth player, and then I can take the role of the scout. Um, but for me, it's a feast and famine system. It's like, if things are going badly, the scout system is going to kick you hard. And if things are going well, you've got a fifth hand on board who can help generate extra resources, who can curate the settlement event deck for you, um, which I love, but it also does make it a bit too easy when you draw the M card and you then go, oh, but I get a second card. I'll take that one. Thank you very much. Bye. Um, and also for me personally, I think the gear grid is too restrictive. Uh, basically, three out of your four slots are more or less set. And in fact, I hit on a, a layout that the only thing I change is what kind of footwear are worn occasionally. Um, and that's that's it. So for me, um, I wanted what was pitched, which was you could have you'd have the scout and they'd be doing the recovery, um, but they'd only join the showdown if you chose to take that risk and it would be a big risk. Instead, I've got an extra hand on the table. When things are all fine and easy, then they're just doing all of the busy work. And if things get scary, then they pop off into a corner and just stay out of it um, in order to act as a safeguard. But that's me. You guys. Yes, yeah, similarly. Do you want to, to go about it, or Audrey, or Shreya? Or... Um, I don't know. <laughs> no, uh, of, of, overall, I think, yeah, but yeah, having the opportunity to get a fifth player in, especially for a demo and having them handle, like, easy to do stuff and showing them the other stuff when you do it is an okay thing. Um, not, not even counting the loss of stats on level two monsters, uh, I personally think that the scout made made things quite easy, to be honest, uh, because you can give your you can use your scout to basically go around and take all the uh, terrain, so you don't have to bother about the terrain, uh, so it frees action. Um, and it's yeah, there extra is... endeavors when it returns. Yeah, and as Kara said, you also have. Um, oh, but my 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 memory uh, went poof. Um... <laughs> ah, sorry, yeah, but you said something spot. about. Yeah, no, I mean it, it 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 it's fine. But like Kara said something about the the scoot uh, being useful for, and I don't remember. My, 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 <laughs> I I knew it when I started my sentence, and poof. Um, anyway, so yeah, but it has possibilities. And then the scout gear, I think, is not a bad idea in itself, but it's expensive. Often you yeah. tend to use your resources for other stuff. It's also stuff. OP. 
yeah, we, we might get to that when we mention high level croc and one specific as good gear uh, or not, but. Oh, even the, the Scout's Lantern is OP. If you didn't archive all that fragile gear, you basically had the perfect item. On yeah, so I. I'm. 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 Uh, how to say that? I'm split on it. Yeah, on, yeah. on my end, I'm. You go, I'm you so go. Yeah, uh, I'm sort of similar. Um, I thought that I quite liked the pitch of the scouts, where, uh, as as Sven said, you had this uh, scout that was out of the the showdown. But if you really wanted it, you could add it to the showdown and like take the risk of maybe losing your gear, but getting like an advantage against the monster. And that was a fun idea. The problem is that the scout is always on the showdown in the end uh which at the start of the game you kind of just want the scout to stay as far away from the monster as possible and to try to avoid uh the monster as much as possible so you can use a uh, fecal sail sail for some scout gear to to avoid that but it feels a bit weird to have this this fifth turn to play on top of every everything else and often you're like well let's just keep it away from the monster at the start and then later on once you can get some proper gear onto it it becomes like quite strong um and i i gotta say i really don't like the mechanic where you can lose all of your gear because that's what that was one of the good uh aspect of kingdom death's difficulties that if you lose a, a showdown sure it's a blow because you lose a good survival but the game was actually built in a way that it wasn't going to do your settlements immediately because you still have had other survivals if you had um some good innovation they were probably they had they probably had some base stats uh you and you still have the have the gear and the gear was like 80 percent of the power if you lose your gear in a campaign if you lose your four best survivals and their gear grid especially since you've not built multiple gear grids. You've built one gear grid, gear grid per, per character and you have some side gear that you've left to the side because you're, you're way past that. If you lose that, that's a massive rollback in your campaign. Uh, and most of the time, I think that would just be, uh, well, the campaign is lost. We need to restart again just because you know, a couple of bad rolls. No, you have, we have to start all the way back to Lantern 1. Uh, I think that's one of us experienced that. Yeah. Kara, uh, you just reported that you fought the butcher today. <laughs> so first of all, like, like until around 4 p.m. yesterday, I loved the scout. Yeah, I, I really <laughs> love the system. Um, w one can discuss uh, about how it starts the scout starts without any gear basically and needs gear to really fill its role um but um i mean the most important gear you get after free lantern years so um i really like the scout in the sense of hey there is this young survivor that accompanies the group and observes and learns um basically that's what i kind of did hey i have this survivor who you know we talked about their survivors with some philosophy that you can't really use in a showdown ah but they can tag along as a scout and still get experience without actually contributing to the fight and um and encourage <laughs> And I really love that. I also love the mitigation, which Fen finds too easy. Um, the, the ability to, with the scout gear, mitigate stuff that I really dislike about KDM. So I love it. I, I love it. It's just it does make things a little bit too easy. Um, but my biggest pro I'd be okay with that by itself. My biggest problem lands with um, when the scout system is going bad for you. Uh, you may as well just like roll up a new campaign from the start. Yeah, the I will not continue my campaign past Lantern Year Four because I lost against the Butcher and you lost everything. I lost everything, mm. and basically um, Lantern Year Five, I start with less gear than Lantern Year One, which is just 
it's not fun. I don't know who in their right mind would design this and think, hey, this sounds like a fun idea. Uh, I, I, I can uh, add up a few things. I started by liking the scout system, so uh, it was fun, actually. But uh, there are two considerations to do. Uh, so far, I never lost a showdown. I think the game overall is a bit easier, especially because uh, uh, Ark Survivor survivability is uh, bigger and uh, you have a way to set up uh, people. Uh, I have a divergent in survivalism, so uh, it's actually real easy to, to, to set up a good ant party, but it's weird that the... So, since I have easy if since I have I've had it easy, I keep getting it easy, extremely easy. I mean, uh, the scout already has heavy gear by default, so you get it uh, all the scavenger kits and stuff. You get a scout lantern, so you don't get. You are sure that you won't get murder and stuff uh, and the bad stuff when you don't need it when you return, especially cracks in the ground, since uh, it's a big year, and, uh, and you, you keep uh, accumulating good stuff. Grimjaw, if you wanted, and you get uh, proficiency from that, you get more uh, resources. You can have a lot of resources with a scout, you get more endeavors and stuff. So when, when like Fen said, when things uh, go well, they keep going extremely well but if you manage to lose in the early years you probably doomed your campaign just because you lose everything and the, the simple concept that you can lose the dreaded pack which is the entire meaning of the scout is is that, that, that's bad that's bad also it's really weird that the scout which is a pillar for uh, the Dreamkeeper campaign works as so poor interactions in the Dreamkeeper campaign. For instance, you get uh, uh, Bonita shutdown, you survive, and what do you do? Do you continue? Do you reduce the level of the quarry you are going for? Or you are suffering starvation, starvation and go back? Why do you have to choose? You know that you will lose all gear on top of that if you lose. So that's one a another thing is uh, uh, basically uh, it's all like this in everything with uh, with the scout it, it, it is weird it it is it feels a bit uh, a bit separated from the rest of the pillars and that is mostly of the shame of it because otherwise, I, I like the idea, I like how it should work, and I like when stuff goes uh, well. Also, it keeps going too well, anyway. I mean, I, I agree. The, the, the whole idea that you can lose the ability to have a scout, which basically means that from this point onward, every time you lose a showdown, you lose all your gear, uh, unless you are very lucky and find a new um, scout backpack, that's just ridiculous. Um, no, th th that's bad. That's bad. It, it but is, it is early, there yeah. is a variant um, in the rulebook that when you lose it, mysteriously a new one appears at the settlement. So there is an official variant that basically says, no, you, you can't lose it. Yeah, um, That's probably and, a better way to play it. Yeah, that's definitely how I would play it. Um, and I mean, I, I, I know people like the, the um, harshness and difficulty of KDM. I'm one of those people who don't really like that. And um, so I really like that. that the Gambler's Chess expansion shows that Adam understands or has started to understand that Yes, there are players who actually would like to have it easier because I, I checked in the, the core game, there were also variants um, in the rulebook and basically all of them made it harder in some way. 
Oh, and... uh, I, I, I have a lot of good example about this. Yeah. Now that there's uh, knowledge, uh, and uh, we will spoil it later, uh, yeah. there is a knowledge in deadism which has a bit of a gotcha moment, but it's good. Okay. So, so and... it's balanced. It's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. And in the Gandalf's chest expansion, first of all, you have the var variant that you can pick your philosophies for the game, that you can choose which philosophies you want to have, um, which makes it more controlled and easier for you because you know what you get, uh, you know what you can use and such. You can have the variant that you can't lose the dreaded backpack for the scout, and you have the variant that the Crimson Crocodile has two toughness less and is always ambushed when you fight against it. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, no, that's an the, interesting the one. The clock is one. easy. It's, yeah. like, like, I was it's like, totally oh, random, but it, it is. is an easy mode. And so with the Gamma Chase expansion, the first time we have an official easy mode for Kingdom Death Monster, which I appreciate. Yeah, um, I want to know why we can't on Blood Drunk Phoenixes, because that's the one I want dealt with. <laughs> I, I don't want to spend any time on the table as a phoenix. Um, so anyway, let's uh, let's move into, for this last bit, uh, a little bit of walking through our campaigns and our experience. Um, and uh, from here on ahead, uh, there will be maybe like real spoilers. We're going to sort of preface by the particular lantern year we're talking about. Uh, so you can be like, I've got this far, I can listen to that, and then stop on the ones after. Uh, we can't promise to get all the way through all of them, um, all the way to Lantern Year 9, Lantern Year 10 or not, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, and I'm going to start off with a, a, a just a doozy, which I just got from yesterday from playing. Um, this isn't a spoiler for uh, anything if you've played People of the Lantern, but I'm really, I'm really annoyed with the Phoenix because I went to hunt it, and one of my uh, hunters on the way in um, managed to have all of his experience wiped away from him. Um, great. Which I was like, I was like, okay, great, fantastic. So I spent the rest of the hunt desperately hoping we wouldn't get, I think it's called Time Flows Backwards, which would then yep. erase him, because I set him up correct for going on the hunt, but I was like, this, this is a level two Phoenix. I've got two more cards to go through. And then we got to the showdown, and he promptly went back to five... <laughs> five age and i was like what was the point in that this is why i hate the phoenix it just it messes around with you in a bookkeeping fashion it's, yeah, it's the, just constantly <laughs> micromanaging you but anyway let's start with something else which is that first couple of crimson crocodiles the prologue crimson crocodile and the lantern year one crimson crocodile um uh, who loves the crimson crocodile the most amazing monster I, love I want it. to. Oh. I want to go first because I love a crimson crocodile, and we did not use the first founding stone on it. We completely went <laughs> and were like, "No, we did not. We did not set up the decks in a proper way, made just for purpose, and yeah, just start smacking it with our uh, stones as daggers, and yeah, let's go." Uh, but uh, and it took us a while to. Hey, hold on. We could have. <laughs> <laughs> that was quite a it's, fun moment. It's always a good idea to keep the four founding stone for a, a higher level later. That I helped mean, us I, the, in it, the it, end. It, First of all, when you set up the um, campaign um, with the Crimson Crow, oh, yeah. really read the red box. <laughs> Yeah, you because I set everything. it up. Uh, I set up the game, the, 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 the showdown, the, the prologue, and I was ready and I looked at the first AI card, which, you know, as with the white line, you put one AI card on top of the deck and I looked and I thought, how the fuck am I supposed to win this fight? And um, and then I read, uh, and then I went to this call and was like, hey, um, am I missing something? Uh, because I thought, hey, every of, one of my survivors is terrified, has the terrified status, uh, can dodge, and uh, when survivors are terrified and attacked by the Crimson Croc, it's bad. And um, yeah. yeah, and it even has, um, for its very first action, the 21,000 Newton um, bite, bite, which I wrote about this on my Patreon, but for people who haven't read that, um, so 21,000 Newtons as a bite sounds like a lot. Um, the Nile Crocodile is a third of the size of the Crimson Crocodile and nearly has the same bite strength. The Crimson Crocodile's bite strength is really weak for its size. 
which is I thought was really funny. It's like a really big, impressive number. It's made of glass. And then, yeah. yeah, yeah, it is. It's made. Of, yeah, I, I was like, this is really thematic. But um, I, I also love the Crimson Crocodile. I love it so much. I think the whole terrified blood pool thing. The solution's right there on the board for you. Yeah. Um, uh, unless you get the hunt event where you're terrified for the whole way in. Um, that, I kind of love that the really crocodile. The cro- it is, yeah. I love that the crocodile can give you both paint and inner lantern. It messed yeah. up with my innovation tree because I got inner lantern in lantern year one. And I was like, well, I'm Ooh. taking it because it would be crazy to not take it. I'm sorry, Alice, the model. You're losing an eye because you're my least favorite survivor anyway. So enjoy. Um, that was amazing. But I particularly. Uh, want to i'm I'm gonna grab the card give me one moment i know exactly where it is i want to read the text on one hit location card which is just uh, the, the character of the crimson crocodile is so good it is just the most yes. flavorful flavor uh, flavorful thing i have um i have seen here we are it yeah. really the is monster... the peter pan crocodile it is yeah uh, yeah here it is the monster flips upside down and glides on its wriggling fingers moving two spaces forward then cranes its neck <laughs> to wink at the attacker like it is it's it's just it's constantly messing and playing and it's not taking it seriously it's just having you, a good time it is it's having a good time but then if you read the descriptions on the coagulated hit locations we'll talk about coagulated in a moment it's not messing around when it's on the coagulated stuff it is suddenly like taking it very seriously i love it i love I, it <laughs> yeah that's right the whole honed mechanic and the coagulated hit locations are obviously not super dense because, uh, you know, that's like a scab forming, it's blood. And yeah, yeah. You, so you can whack them and you learn about that. It's really... And really you know it's not the trap. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, you know it's not the trap. But you do have to get in the right position. But also, mm-hmm. if you're in the wrong position and you can't get there, like say the coagulated hit location is in the rear and it's... Uh, not in the rear, but it's against the side of the board, you can still just hit the monster and go... I, I'm I'm not going to wound this. Sure, that's fine. My survivor just fell over. Um, yeah, I, I'm having just a deck uh, moving. I, uh, my English is going away today. Yeah, you're just moving moving the deck around. That okay? Yeah. That's yes. a de- one one dead card. Re- okay. I can see why the Crimson Crocodile is the first monster that you encounter. And it's got a similar thing to the White Line, where the White Line is the perfect introductory monster for players. This Crimson Crocodile is a perfect introductory monster for players who've been through all the previous stuff. And they're looking to see, you know, what's up now. Oh goodness, there's there's a lot to think about here, and a lot of opportunities. And oh, the gear, uh, the yeah. armor set. Oh yeah. Yes. And next time, next time I play the croc, I want to have a soundboard with the uh, Star Fox <laughs> Nintendo 64. No, to I, 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 I like the thematicity of the Crimson Crocodile, although my most thematic uh, monster is the Latnas. But we will have a chance to talk about about that someday yeah, yeah. Uh, but Hopefully. a beautiful thing about uh, the crimson crocodile is actually how it's perfectly embedded in the campaign i mean uh, first the, the 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 gear you get is not that useful against it except the except one specific piece of gear which basically destroys level two which is the clobber uh, with the croc bone hammer which is basically there just to destroy the Crimson Crocodile level 2. Uh, but I, it's beautiful. I like that yeah. it's like a, a scaling weapon that you buy, and it's like, yeah. this is okay against level 1, but it helps me against the level 2. Uh, yeah, that's good. exactly. That, that's beautiful, and uh, it's beautiful how it works. Everything from, from the Crimson Crockery works against the Smog Singers and vice versa. Yeah, I've yeah. been running the Crimson. Cro- oh, yeah, the, the, I was, yeah, you're right. That the, um, there's such a great interplay between the two monsters that they obviously complement each other. Um, but I just want to say, like, I think the Crimson Crocodile armor uh, so far is my favorite of all of the designed armors outside of the Dragon King armor, which I personally love despite its flaws. I, I'm, I'm like it's. My Crimson Crocodile Survivor, um, I'm still running them in the mid part of the campaign because they have more armor points than everyone else. And they get to f- they get to fist monsters really hard, which makes me happy to say that. <laughs> I, defi- 
I think that uh, in that both the smoke singers and the croc and I don't know when I will see that uh, maybe in the king but I think that here in the gambler's chest we have such good example of balance between thematic mechanics in the fight gear and 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 I think that's the first time I'm seeing it in kingdom death and and also probably in any game where there is such it it fits it's it's a whole it's a, an ensemble and you cannot take one thing away even like say oh there is this mechanic without feeling that it it goes along with all the rest and even the few events uh the hunt uh etc everything participates to that and it for for me uh, knowing that I am not a big, let's say, lore person uh, for KDM, it was the first time I felt like I was grasping the bits of lore from the stuff. Because it, for me, it needs to be a bit more obvious than, than usual, but wow. That, that left me I, speechless. Yeah. Uh, I personally think that this is definitely the, the best uh, Node 1 monster that we've had. And it's very nice because it can be at the same time a really good prologue monster and also just a really fun monster to fight because um, the lion is a perfect introductory monster, but it loses a little bit of its shine as you fight it more and more. The croc just never does because it keeps fr it keeps itself fresh thanks to that uh, uh, coagulated death uh, deck. I think that the gear yeah is is amazing i really like the knowledge card too blood dancer is uh incredibly strong and it encourage uh risk and reward uh gameplay which i always love along um, with the armor yeah yeah it, it works perfectly here yeah, with the armor but it also has a lot of um uh space to to function with other monsters because i can already see the the croc having like really good uh, synergies with uh, the Sunstoker, for example, or the Dragon King. Um, yeah, I, it's all in all an amazingly designed fight. And uh, to bounce back a little bit on that thematic that was mentioned, I think that all of the elements of the GC, except maybe for the Phoenix, have that idea of um, game or playfulness to them like then they do not approach the fight in such a serious manner as other monsters do and they always toy around with the survivors a little bit uh between the smoke singer having that empathy mechanic the cro the croc being uh so playful and, and uh, weird uh, atnas also having his own deal with with all of that the the bone, uh, the bone encounter, the bone eater encounter, having also a little bit of that. I think that makes the whole GC feel a lot more team than uh, base KDM can feel. So yeah, uh, the croc just cements uh, all of it. And as much I as it pains me to, to say it, it uh, Adam was right to add it to the GC, so. <laughs> I have two things I don't like about the Crimson Crocodile. First of all, um, the monster resources. Um, I feel like there are too many different specific monster resources, which makes, uh, on the one hand, it's cool that it, it kind of forces your hand. It's not like, hey, I'm just getting always this one weapon because that is the best weapon from the Crimson Crocodile. No, you get the weapon you can afford because, oh, you have this specific resource, so that's the weapon you can buy. That's good. But when it comes to the armor set, it kind of sucks. I fought the Prologue and two level one Crimson Crocodiles and I haven't completed an armor set because I'm yeah, missing same. the resource for it. And the tail? The tail's a pain to get. I got the tail two times. Oh. <laughs> I'm missing mm. pale flesh. Oh, um, yeah, the, yeah there's, there's got like four or five. Four, I think it's four of them in the deck, but yeah. And, uh, yeah, uh, and the thing got some fin. <laughs> yeah, so I, that's what I don't like. I think either, you know, have more of like the basic monster resources in there or just you know skip one or two of the special ones and and 
basically trim the deck a little so you um, have a higher chance of getting these basic ones you need for the armor set. Oh, or, and... do, 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 uh, do, do not archive and record. Keep the cards. Oh, oh yeah. an important thing. <laughs> uh, it it uh, it gates the bow for a level two. Oh, oh, yeah. that's really uh, nice. Yep, yeah, um, and also I'm I'm very amused by the scythe being sat there going, "Hey, go on, go on. Do you want to save thirteen <laughs> blood glass? Go on, go on, go on. Yeah, it's 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 worth it if you can last that long and get it to it. But to, yeah. but um, it's end game. And, it's end game. The thing is, yeah, it's got end game power levels. But actually, uh, first of all, you need to own the Dragon King to make proper use of scythes. Um, yeah. Womp womp. Um, but also. Uh, by the time you save up enough blood glass, unless you're very fortunate with the drops, you've got weapons that are like on the same par anyway, which is kind of uh, amusing. But I like the idea of a hey, here's a goal for you to save towards, <laughs> which is yeah. which is fun to see something like that on there. The, the other part I don't like about the Crimson Crocodile is the first Crimson Day settle event, settlement event. So after you fight a prologue, you have the first day event, but this time it's the first Crimson Day because you fought a Crimson Crocodile. Now, I never really liked the first day event that you roll how many survivors are there. That's kind of okay, you can be lucky or you not, and there's no way of you to, to influence that in any way. Um, this is the same but worse because not only determines it's your starting survivors, but also whether your cloth starting gear gets an upgrade. Um, and with the new um, uh, armor set, uh, clothed and satiated, which basically just means, hey, have a, a piece of armor on every location and then you're clothed and satiated and get bonus armor. Um, having a piece, the bloody cloth, um, that you can put anywhere is really strong because with the cloth gear, it's obvious that the uh, leg armor or, or the waist armor is the last one you will craft of an armor set. Um, because if you have the four other pieces, you get clothed and satiated. Uh, but if you have the bloody cloth, you are more flexible and you can say, hey, this waist armor of the Crimson Croc, for example, is quite nice. Whereas yeah. the leg armor isn't. So I just put the bloody cloth on the leg. Indeed. Uh, so anyway, um, uh, I'm aware of time. And Alessio, uh, you have to yeah. you have to leave us now, don't you? Yeah, work calls. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I would talk about I would talk about this for hours, and uh, we actually uh, kind I mean, of we did. did. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure we'll come back to it when we've uh, when all, a number yeah. of us have completed the campaign, so we can do like a post mortem on it in full. Uh, for definite because yeah. there's still a lot more to talk about and i look forward to your thoughts on why you liked atnas so much and his um, yeah exactly and, and, and the way that, that he he just cuts surge off your survivors no i love how you play the showdown that that's so fun <laughs> you is. just sneak around try to make it forget it's beautiful <laughs> yeah yeah all right so so goodbye everyone a uh, fun, yeah. Thank you. Uh, oh yeah, Alessio. One final thing, short as possible. Uh, how do you feel about smog singers? As that's our next topic. No, I I still hate them. A actually, they are pretty well designed, but they, they, they you hate them. Uh, I I just came to terms with the fact that you have to Benny heal them across the showdown board. Uh, that's when you have to hope. Basically, uh, the level one is pretty okay. The level 2 with a 50% chance of getting uh, Devil's Melody is actually... Uh, you will go back... Uh, I actually started my campaign with not a lot of AI control, uh, with not a lot of stuff. I, I started bringing double row eye dead bands to that. So that, that's basically it. Uh, anyway, they are pretty well designed, the armor set is incredibly bonkers for tanks and uh, they work beautiful with ballads, so you have to have a lot of them and so on. Alright, great. Well, uh, we'll speak yeah. to you again in our next recording, I'm sure. Have a good rest of, uh, rest of your day, Alessio. 
Yeah, I will go working, so you can imagine. I'm sure yeah. it'll be See fun you. working Goodbye. on Friday afternoon. Bye. Yeah, have fun. Take care. All right, uh, so before we go on to that, as, as Kai started talking about it, uh, let's go to our what philosophies do people get and, yeah, clothed and satiated was something I definitely wanted to talk about as well. Yeah, but, but, oh, um, <laughs> uh, clothed yeah. and satiated, first of all, I was, it was just pointed out to me that I played it wrong. Um, it's actually the second time I'm playing clothed and satiated wrong. Um, and for clothed and satiated, you only need three pieces of armor gear. <laughs> so, um, yeah, good to know. Um, the other time I played it wrong was when in Lantern Year 1 I equipped my survivors and gave one survivor clothed and satiated because, hey, I haven't finished the uh, rawhide set, so you, you know, have enough, you're clothed and satiated. And then in Lantern Year 2 I unlocked clothed and satiated. <laughs> so. Such, such is learning. <laughs> but, um, uh, uh, rules rules hiccups aside i think clothes and satiated might be my favorite single thing in the entire of the campaign and a big argument for playing collective cognition all the time it was so it's nice really to really good it, it's really good and it was also just nice to be like oh hey so if my monster armor set isn't getting there uh, cuz i'm missing a piece like car experienced i can at least wear most of it and go out there and just have whatever or i can put mixed bits of pieces together from different sets and actually get a kind of set bonus mm -hmm. yeah the more yeah, i play with like... it the more i like it uh, also um as you mentioned the bloody cloth i don't like that you get the bloody cloth for the best role i think you should get the bloody cloth for the lowest role of population um because it's like once again that win winners win more and losers um get to go home and sit without their bloody cloth yeah um, but I did love, like, literally the first thing I did was I moved the bloody cloths to everyone's head. And the idea of, like, <laughs> they, they, they like, got, arrived in the settlement, dipped these uh, waste cloths in blood, and then went, right, what are we going to do with these now? We're going to wear them on our heads as, like, <laughs> turbans and veils, and now we're going to go kill a crocodile just otherwise completely <laughs> naked. Which, that I, I actually wish we could get some sculpts of bloody cloth survivors wearing bloody cloth in different places, because... I mean, there's a load of nudity in the gambler's chest now anyway on the minis, so it doesn't really matter anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I Also, if, I think that if you take the cogn cognitive cognition, collective cognition, sorry, uh, bloody cloth or cloth and satiated and stuff like that and transfer that to a core game, uh, people of the lantern, the advanced people of the lantern, that's going to completely change. Um, I'm not going to say everything, but... Uh, Difficulty level uh, can be shifted like completely, and uh, that's uh, creating, let's say, an, an opportunity for either having a bit of an easier run. To be honest, uh, I I'm confident that the advanced survivors are stronger, are stronger than the uh, normal one, let's say. Um, and so that that brings two different things. First one for people that feel that like they struggle, like. Hey, here's some help, but also for the let's say hardcore gamers, uh, how early can I take on a level three Dragon King, and pushing uh, boundaries and getting uh, early and earlier and earlier and earlier on stuff and trying to get all oh, this piece of gear demands so much of like like the size or anything that is equivalent to it. Let's say in the core game that demands me to kill. Uh, this type of monster to three times at level three and yeah that's that's the chance to do it that's the chance to push uh, stuff and that's the chance in my opinion as well to get to some gear pieces and builds that you can not have or later uh, otherwise and then try so much stuff let's say in a legal way and not just yeah i'm going to make a mock-up of a shutdown just to test it yeah um i say like building on that kind of pushing people harder uh, to go against harder things the one point reduction in toughness from eight to seven and the same with the level two versions for the smog singer and the um, crocodile that totally changed like my play because i from the very yeah. start i had a terrible set of draws hang on Sorry, the cough. Uh, I had a terrible set of draws for um, weapon uh, potential. I built exactly one weapon in the first Lantern year, um, uh, which was a hone, the honed cleaver, 
Blood Glass, Blood Glass Cleaver, which immediately hit a super dense location because that's what I mm-hmm. do. Obviously. Um, <clears throat> but it was like, I was like, this is okay. I can take Survival of the Fittest and I got a couple of Founding Stones and I got Fists. I can manage this. And, it pr- and I only fought two level ones in the whole of the campaign so far. I pushed on to level two straight away. That's actually something yeah. I'm thinking I should have done. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Basically, um, what I did in my campaign, I um, prologue, level one croc, then level one smog singers, and then again level one crocodile. And I um, feel mm. like I should have only done crocodiles until the butcher. So I complete the set hopefully um i get a level two crocodile in there before the butcher um that's kind of my my thought process now so when i try again i think i'll try this yeah i was really fortunate with the smog singers because i had the in the the introductory event i got the two smog singer resources and a pacifist survivor and then um on the way there i found a dead smog singer which gave me another piece of um of resource and then i just like i already had the blood glass saw so i was already playing a crit build on one survivor and i got a full set of singing armor out of my first encounter with the smog singers so the butcher just like was so ineffectual because smog singer armor is everything i want from a node 2 armor set it is just like really well designed it's got exactly the armor points i want the abilities i want it's it's such a standout and i think it is physically on the models gorgeous funny and gorgeous yeah my first smog singer fight netted me exactly four smog singer resources all of which were bones (laughs) and the basic resources had no hide in them (laughs) That's always an oof. You had the opposite situation for me, where I had like yeah. <laughs> very few weapons and a, and like a good amount of armor. I finished the Crimson Crocodile armor and the Smog Singer armor. Actually, your you. your experience what was kind of what led me to try the Smog Singers uh, because mm. you you told how 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 you got the whole armor set from one fight and thought, oh yeah, I give it a try. And after the fight, I decide which one is closer to completion: the Smog Singer or the Crimson Crocodile. And um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I didn't even finish a rawhide set until after the butcher with how things were going for me, which was kind of um crazy. And I I very nearly built a second smog singer set before facing Atnas, and the only reason I didn't is because I I missed out on two pieces of, of pink flesh. Um I think it's called the hide resource from the smog singer. Yeah, singers. pink flesh is kinda hard yep. to get. Yep. And then Promptly after that, I went and hunted some level three smog singers and built a new set of smog singer armor and went, okay, right, well, I got leather, leather singer and croc. And the crimson crocodile armor is hanging with the others. That is, it's it's so impressive, but when used with the crimson pearls, which give you bleed yeah. on arrival. Um, and so I have bandages, crimson pearls. I arrive with four bleed tokens and then immediately pop the action to put the armor points on and go to town. Uh, I'm going to be sad when it falls off, but because I'm going for a Phoenix armor set now. I don't remember exactly, but I I think here we have one croc armor. I think it's full. I think we have one smoke singer armor full, yeah. one hide, yeah. and one leather mostly done, but partly. not full. Yeah, partly yeah. leather, and we are just uh, a couple of years after Atnas. Yeah, we we did a Zambato, and uh, it it pairs so well with leather, so. Yeah, it does. I I have kept on putting off making a Zambato because I've been sticking <laughs> perfect bones into other things. I don't think I'm yeah. going to make one now. But and, I do have... A, pers- we've just, I have Impermanism, which does have frail synergies, so it's been tempting. Very much so, yeah. Uh, I really like the Smog Singer fight. I thought that the level 1 was is way too easy. Uh, and even yeah. the level 2 We, we also had too... easy cards. You, yeah, we we had a little we we had a little uh, kerfuffle in the game, but still, I I've tried it uh, on my own, and it, the the fight is not that hard. And I I get what Adam was trying to do with the whole songs and ballads and the 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 empathy uh, stuff that's that's growing, but 
I kind of feel like the monster needs to be a little bit more threatening, and yeah, maybe I, I get what you mean. Maybe yeah. it's yeah, I I really like its gear, and I think it's great, but it feels a little bit low too low level. Like it feels like it's good to go against a croc level two, uh, a croc level one and two. But I would love for the smog singer to show up in year five or six or five and be a better bridge with more stuff because at the moment uh well making the armor is great but the weapons are definitely better on the croc side and after fighting a a couple of times getting the armor and a couple of gear i don't really see anything that i need to do with the crocs with the the smoke singer and they are not as big of a a uh, Russell's drop as the croc in um, all experiments, yeah, it, at least. It, it, it does participate to creating that, let's say, whole effect between Lanternier 5 and 5. Yeah. five. It, between when still... the phoenix drops, you do two phoenixes, and then you're like, oh, yeah. shit. No, no and, twos yeah. are still kind of weird in the game. Yeah, it's it's basically a node 1.5. Um, the I... Once I fought the higher level um, smog singers, I was like, I can see what the problem is with the level one is it doesn't get any of the moods, um, and like the whole design of the smog singers is they're like punching bags, the other and yeah. and they're meant to get hurt and hurt and hurt, and you feel bad about doing it, and then the more you've hurt them, the more they turn back that back onto you, and then that triggers the singing and everything. But the yeah. level ones just they have a standard uh, wound pool. The level twos have a big wound pool. Um, and they start singing, uh, but yeah, it's uh, it's it's an odd one. Thematically, it's really really good. Mechanically, I mixed on it. I the level one, it feels like fighting the level one screaming antelope, where you're like, this thing has some problems that are not making it particularly threatening unless certain things line up. Um, yeah, I love them to pieces, and I hate them in equal amounts. Um, but I, I I love muffin hats. Muffin hats at, my favorite thing. At the same time, I'm going to let's semi advance uh, a little bit. But uh, when we did the first smoke singers, they had two times the card that says basically the, the plea for life. Uh, oh, yeah. And we di- and we did draw it twice and discard most of the rest. And the plea for life is just useless, completely useless. Oh. And and so for us that didn't take being so easy because they were just like pleading for life and doing nothing and we we had a, a quite similar uh, experience on Atnas which I'm not going to talk in details uh, yet but we had the same kind of experience on Atnas where half the cards that Atnas drew were super easy we discarded the rest and we were looking at an yeah we were very lucky with uh, with Atnas yeah. And I mean, it, it can happen. It's a possibility that yeah, you are very lucky in the cards. So as much as you are not lucky and you do the phoenix and your first card is déjà vu, I will remind you that I cannot find this card in my game box. I don't know why. <laughs> um, but you you can have it in a very easy way or in a very hard way. And we did have that such easy way there, and it was impressive. I I'm not sure that having two times this card in deck even existing is a great thing and it's not very fun yeah yeah um the first time i faced the level threes they uh did the they immediately opened with the smell of trust which meant all of them ran up and threw themselves on the ground and i was like uh i guess later on if i had guilt tokens this can cause some issues because it causes brain trauma but right here right they now those themselves? smog singers are doomed they stunned themselves no, they threw themselves, yeah. knocked, knocked themselves down, yeah. Yeah, Just... well, but, yeah that's, that's what our Atnas did. Oh, we... Atnas knocked himself with laughter on the we floor. We also... And... Ah! On our level 2, we also had the, the one where the second smoke singer skip its turn, and that immediately like negates a lot of the danger of the fight. Mm, uh, yeah. that, that being said, I think that the way Adam does a fight with multiple monsters works really well. It's a bit annoying to have to play all three monsters turn one by one but uh i think that the foul the fight felt really nice it was cool to be able to move all survivors around them to try to figure out how to attack them and how to make sure that we would be able to to keep attacking and to to stay uh, along with them to 
to keep the survivors that we don't want hit uh, away from the the ones that would be dangerous that all felt super interesting especially since the other tournament mechanic that we get at level two uh requires us to eat each of uh, of them one by one uh i really like that mechanic to discard the mood and to to play around the showdown that's not just well the mood is there now you have to deal with it or maybe you have a, a whip or something uh, i i think that there's a lot of good ideas it's the weakest of the fights in the gc at the moment uh in my opinion at the the one that i tried at least i found the smog thing as well in regards to multiple miniatures fight kind of iffy <laughs> um i have to say i ambushed them so um oh. I, it, it started quite confusing because Ambush says you can place monster and survivors and terrain however you like, as long as you follow the terrain placement rules. So I decided, sure, I guess the rules tell me I can place one smog singer in one corner, survivors around it, and the others in the other corner and just hit this one smog singer. Yeah? Um, I'm pretty sure that's correct. And um, yep, it is. But then they had some AI card, which I kind of interpreted as they, you know, have unlimited movement for it. And, yeah, they do. Yeah. The and, then play, and then they pl are placed behind their target, but there was no space behind that the target because I was sat in the corner and I wasn't really sure how to handle this. Um, yeah. But um, so it, it it was kind of weird the whole fight for me. Yeah, there's a little bit of jankiness into the fight. That's for sure. I the putting them in the corner is definitely something that you can do. Uh, other, uh, that being said, it's negated by the level two smooth, so it gets like it it becomes a bad idea later. But the level one is the level one feels like it's not fully baked, and that's kind of a. Uh, uh, annoying because it's a it's a fun fight otherwise yeah um so then we have our third of the potentially early uh game monsters um did is anyone run into the bone eaters we yes. did okay no. um please do tell me all about it because i uh, ran but before we do that gone. um you 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 touched a subject which we kind of passed over uh, mm -hmm. the philosophies oh good yes you're quite right yeah the philosophies because after that i would go because i've not not encountered atmos or bone eaters or anything we're not sure. going to talk about that that's today Different. i don't think mm, probably <clears> not <throat> no we'll, we'll let uh, lesio um, be involved in the conversation i think so go ahead philosophies philosophies so um you start with four philosophies you have a uh, starting philosophy survivalism that has everyone then you have dreamism which is uh, specific for the uh, keepers of the dream campaign and uh, then two random level ones there are four level ones in the game um i drew deadism and lanternism i Me love too. lanternism Me too. i think it's amazing um it's kind of uh when survivors die this one gains becomes stronger and um <clears throat> and i hate deadism <laughs> because i yeah. feel I don't Someone who adopted we... deadism can't be used because the neurosis is they can't gain insanity. We did I've... not get lanternism. Uh, which one did we get instead? I think well, we did. I, uh, we got lanternism. Oh, no, I got de okay. I got deadism by the way, and that is one of my favorite survivors. Is my deadism survivor? So, so maybe we did get lanternism, but no one drew it. Yeah, that was a problem for me. I spent a lot of the early game with just um, survivalism and dreamism and kept drawing those. Hmm. Yeah, uh, I really like deadism, but yeah, you cannot take a deadism survival to fight the croc. And that's a really bad idea to do it. And we did it once and then we decided, oh, that was really dumb. Let's not do that again. Or the, that, the problem is that in the early game we kind of want to fight the, the croc more than the smog so the deadism survival like don't get to be in the spotlight um the deadism survival I mean, also just got Im immortal so i mean Sorry. i have to say Good my point. my one deadism survivor kind of had the perfect combination um they had 
um, that is with Death Poet as the tenant knowledge, which uh, basically means they gain a strength token on brain trauma once per shown down, and if they suffer brain trauma, they get again an observation. They had darkness, so it, I had it on level two, so they got plus one on brain trauma, and evermore, which is I have a half love hate relationship to the knowledge evermore. Um, basically, it gives you undeathable. Uh, which is great, so 50% chance to survive when you're dying. Um, to level it up, this needs to happen three times. Which is kind of hard to achieve. Well, there's a few um, of the knowledge cards that I felt you were not supposed to upgrade intentionally or to try to look to upgrade, like the ones where you take damage, because the, uh, the upgrades often is the next time you'll take less damage. So those cards I feel are less interesting. Um, I much rather the ones that are more active and that gives you a bonus that you want to then try to hit. Um, yeah, but I... I Overall, I really like the philosophies. Uh, I, I think it's a good addition. My only problem is that it's a lot of bookkeeping. Uh, we had to shuffle through a lot of booklets and, and keep things updated. And the fact that each survivors that get them start them back from the start, uh, while well, I get the, the point of it, that's, that makes things a little bit harder. Uh, we had not, to, not exactly, we were, not exactly. I mean, if someone else has leveled up the tenant knowledge, if yeah, the, the knowledge, yeah, but the it, they get the better you know. tenant knowledge. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, but the philosophy they, you have to start from the the start, which um, I mean, it works. It just feels a little bit weird since that one is the more uh, story wise. Uh, one thing that I really uh, that we we were very lucky to uh, is that we fought the phoenix and the survival that had uh, murderism got uh i'm not going to spoil what it does but got like a lot of level uh up thanks to the phoenix uh, aging mechanics and so we we got to basically like brush through the the deadism uh philosophy really quickly and got a really strong survival early on so that was kind mm -hmm. of fun um yeah uh, philosophy in general really liked it I think that's a great addition, and I'm really looking forward to see in in uh, uh, COD uh, philosophy for the ex existing monster and maybe for the existing campaigns. Like I would love to see uh, Sunstoker philosophies that deal with the Sunstoker campaign. I think that would be amazing. What yeah. about you, Fen? Um, yeah, I, uh, I, I was often missing observations because there's just a lot oh, yeah. to keep a track of. Um, yeah. And obviously, you if you if the rules say if you miss a positive observation, then tough luck. So I ended up... That got better when I found I printed off a sheet of references from Board Game Geek. So I actually had that there. But previously, I had all of the knowledge cards lined up um, using GameGenic card stands. So I could look at them to try and not miss the things. Um, I got Facism as one of mine. Um, and Facisms illustrated by uh, Melissa Natalie K. Cochran, yeah. who we, she also does the um, the settlement locations. So we got Facism, not uh, Lanternism. Facism like illustrations are just. Uh, facism and Lanternism have my favorite artwork in the game. I, yeah. There's such different styles, and I, I but they're, they're amazing. I don't know who did the Lanternism artwork. Um, but yeah, the, the facism artwork is just amazing. The, the bright splashes of psychedelic colors and things. It's just, yeah, yeah, yeah. like yeah. wonderful. Um, but like for a lot of mine, I, I've got romanticism unlocked now because I'd like to take a romantic for my societies. Um, I had deadism, lanternism, facism, and impermanism. Um, and... That but I we've got roadblock by a lot of dreamism and um and survivalism just constantly being drawn out of the philosophy deck uh, whenever my characters reach the time for a philosophy so I've had a lot of like extra survival um through tenacity uh, and survivors yeah. who refuse to encourage each other which is fine because you also have fist pump so 
I I really like the philosophy system. Oh my god, you're feel, right. I I didn't like, get that. Mm -hmm. If you can encourage, you can still say fist bump. Oh my god. Yes. Yeah. Good. Um, yeah. Okay. It, it feels like too slightly too much uh, bookkeeping, and it feels like too much random in some of the new mechanics, and that that's something that. Uh, comes back a lot in the in the game in the gambler stress in general i think uh but i really like the idea i really like the energy the teaming uh everything about the philosophy system that isn't uh drawing them and yeah. uh keeping track of what you're doing and what you want to yeah. do and how much cc you they need are and, they're yeah. they're wonderful not only mechanically but also for providing little snapshots into the rest of the world Marrowism is a super interesting one um, when you guys encounter it. Uh, regalism is also a lot of like pretty deep lore stuff. That was very cool um, uh, and, and quite fun as well, the way it's designed. Uh, like Not to go into too much detail, but with regalism, um, you can't depart unless you fulfill a certain condition which is dependent on other survivors. And it's That's really nice. fun to try and solve the puzzle of like, okay, so I need... I need this person to be worse at this than ever, than, than somebody else. Um, and who can I take out? Oh, I can't take them out. No, hang on. Where's this person? And so on. That was uh, quite fun in itself as well. Um, we unlock uh, gourmandism uh, close ooh. to the end of oh, yeah. our... Uh, gourmandism uh, yeah. is so fun. It, it, it looks super fun, but also demanding because you need to have resources to feed uh, your survivor. But yeah, it looks fun. Yeah, I, I haven't seen that one yet. Um, I have seen a couple of cards related to it that I was like, ooh, yes, please. But, yeah, it's um, like consume stuff and be a tank. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really, really uh, looks like a fun thing. Um, for me, um, my position is, as I said, I was really apprehensive about this system. It's the one I wasn't sure would work. I don't think I'm playing without it. And my only um, disappointment is the same as you guys. I think Vaultless is a, just kind of removing a little bit too much of the game. Um, yeah, definitely. I, I definitely. I do not think you should have um, Knowledges and three, uh, three Fighting Arts. The Survivors with Knowledges are already really strong. Um, but I would... I, I Yeah, Vaultless is kind of like... There's one table of, oh, you might get your Fighting Art, and I rolled on that one a little bit. Um, but then the rest of the time, I just rolled in on the other one because I, I, I just don't... The downside is too much, really, yeah. to justify. Yeah, but the downside is a lot. Yeah, I'd have to get something like tough or something really good. Like I wouldn't mind getting, um, yeah, uh, like some extra insanity resistance for a for a deadism survivor. I might think about making the roll then, but it is an interesting decision. Um, so time will tell. But yeah, it's it, the 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 whole philosophy knowledge system is way better than it was pitched when I saw it on the. On, on the Kickstarter, we forgot one important thing. It's it's it's. <clears throat> um, we're done with philosophies, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. In the in the um, Gamma Shakers pen, there is a new intimacy event, and I adore it because of two reasons. First of all, um, you have a way to avoid the one result, um, which killed Audrey and me in our uh, try of a campaign where we repeatedly wrote double ones um, <clears throat> even though we, we had to protect the young but if you roll double ones it doesn't matter which one to choose so um, and here you can avoid it basically every time you get at least one collective recognition in this lantern year you won't roll double ones um, the second thing if you read very carefully, you can have females having a child together. Yes. Or males yes. having a That's child together. Yes. Nice. You don't have to nominate a male and a female survivor. You just have to nominate two survivors. That and is I a love nice it. change to the game. <laughs> you, you, you can do the full Amazons. Yes. 
<laughs> yeah, it's um, yeah, I I just I was like that's that's nice, um, and I do hope there's a few people who got their panties in a twist over that, <laughs> uh, who are who are upset. Um, it, it did do one thing for me, which is uh, I realised I had numerous survivors going out on the hunt and multiple things, and I was like, I've not even checked the box for what gender they are because unless. I really should do because the man eaters does still um, sterilize males, but I, yeah. I was just like uh, I, I've been forgetting because I, it's there's so much else to pay attention to and bookkeep. Um, so I was just like, okay, well, the, whatever model they are on when when they first go out, they're going to be that marked as that gender then, um, just to keep it consistent with the model. And uh, very yeah. and very close to that, the birth settlement event is. Mag- one of the magnificent pieces of art. It's it so is. colorful, so joyful, yeah, it's so nice. oh. do you, So, do you know what I did the first time I got that? Um, for people who are following along the Discord, when I was first playing, I got tons and tons of perfect resources. And we found out that's because, again, of the card waiting issue, because the perfect resources thicker. So I kept cutting to those by accident. Um, when I, so when I got the birth event, I stuffed all three perfect resources into a survivor, and then I handed her a weapon I got from the um, from from the level two crimson crocodile. Uh, it's not the bow. Um, the crimson crocodile pulled a legendary card that spawned a indomitable weapon at the end of the fight, and it pulled the legendary card right as its very last uh, AI card. So I I got. A particular weapon that normally only has one speed, and my survivor, she was running with two speed. And let's just say, even level threes had a really rough time against her. <laughs> she's just retired, um, and and she's sitting back and relaxing and handed on the hammer. And it's not as impressive now. It's on a survivor with one speed, but yeah, it's um, it was that was a really fortunate role. Um, so yeah, that's I was super happy with philosophies. We're a little tight on time, so Kara, we're going to talk about the bone eaters, and then yep, we'll wrap that's up. That's my cue. Yep. Okay. Uh, well, I hope you play play again, Kara, and I hope you have a better time. And um, here's here's what I did with the scout against the butcher. I made a fecal salve, and um, she smeared that all over her face. So the scout the survived. The scout survived. Oh, you didn't get the roll for recovery. Yeah, I rolled a one. Yeah, that that does, well then. That, that yeah, that uh, it shouldn't. That, just, that uh, really sucks. Oh, well. Yeah, but hopefully it goes better next time. Yeah, um, I, I hope so too. I think I will house rule one or two things there. It's <laughs> your game. It's yeah. always a yeah. good idea. Yeah. So have, it have fun talking about the bone eaters. Yep, we're going to do you. bone eaters, and then we'll kind of wrap up. Uh, so yeah, right. Say bye. bye. Thank you, Kiara. Bye bye. Okay, right. so when did you guys run into the Bone Eaters? Because I ran in the, into them in Lantern Year 12, so I don't have a typical experience. Before then, that, since early. we played only to Lantern Year 10, and we decided to take out their next cards of the hunt deck the following year, because we did not want to have that two years in a row. Um, well, ma- be- because we... Yeah, yeah. We, we didn't so, want it to, to get the fights immediately afterwards, because it just felt tiring. Yeah, my experience from that is that, yeah, okay, it's fun, but it's too much to set up for too close to nothing. It's not worth the time. So the fight took maybe 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes, because it goes very quickly. Every yeah. bonator has only 2 HP. Uh, I like the fight mechanics. I think that the encounter system to, to fight monster is fun, but I... The hunt is already the space of the game that I like the least. Uh, It takes a long time to set up, to draw the cards, to have the little event, and then to get to finally the bit that you actually want to do, the showdown. If the encounter completely replaced the hunt, I would be fine with it. I think that it would would work well as a substitute where you actually do stuff and, and play the game. Uh, but having to do the hunt that is already something that I find tiring then having to interrupt the hunt take out the the board uh, play the encounter it takes only 10-15 minutes and then and then get back to the hunt uh, I don't really see the, the point of it uh, the rewards are nice I kind of like the, the scalpel I think it's a f- really fun gear but I the fight itself would be fun if it had a space for it, but I feel like it doesn't really. That's that was my experience. Well, 
our experience ish. Right. Yeah, because that's interesting. I was hoping you would say, oh, it was a, a bit more of a um, like challenge, but 10 minutes. No. I mean, that's no. Uh, I, that's what happened with me is like literally, I ran into Atlanta in year 12, and I was like, okay, all right, cool. Well, I don't think they're going to stand up particularly well, but it should at least be interesting. The first attack just killed one of them, like stone dead. And then the second attack would have been enough to kill the, the other one twice over. And I was like, oh, these, these, I thought these guys were going to have a bad time, but they really had a bad time. For, so for me, the problem wasn't the encounter, although I now have the encounter board permanently set up and I just keep rule books on top of it. The problem was they took so long to turn up that by the time they did, I was like, eh. And they have a mechanic to stop you running into them too early. They've got like a, you can't, if it's before Lantern Year 2, you don't encounter the level 1s or it might be up to Lantern Year 2 or something. There's like a limit yeah. on them before, yeah. Uh, but there's no like aging mechanic. So it isn't like, oh, hey, you've reached like Lantern Year 8, um, 9. So remove the previous card if it's level 1 and ensure you have the level 2 to scale them up. They just didn't um scale up but i do like that it's one less basic hunt event in the deck i always appreciate that yeah um <laughs> not the... very convinced mm. yeah no no i mean it, I... it's fair I, I i do think i think the encounter system as a whole is really promising um i think they need they I think they need to fine tune it a little bit more in campaigns of death to just make it a bit yeah. tighter um, for, for sure. sure yeah yeah uh, perhaps like if you win the showdown fight you can skip forward to overwhelming darkness or something um, very just, honestly to... i would be more interesting in the encounter system uh in a game that has a rhythm like um not a, a cyclic thing with every lantern year every turn every call it however you want a fight um and sometimes you do not have a fight, and sometimes you have the encounter instead of a fight. I, I would rather have it, let's say, spice up the rhythm than add up to the rhythm. Yeah. 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 I get what Audrey so, is saying. Yeah, I do, yeah. Yeah, so I guess the verdict kind of here at this point is like hand waving up and down type thing of like, eh. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. However, yeah. the models of the monitor are super fine. Uh, the the event that introduces them is great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, um, yeah. That, that, that the whole thing is really fantastic. Um, and as we're in spoiler sections, um, I don't know. They 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 they're a mystery box which is explained within the gambler's chest, which I like. Yes. I like that everything about where they come from. Um, why they are the way they are is explainable and you can encounter that content and learn um, with it um, which is super cool but I don't know if you guys are, are aware at all I don't know if you not uh, yet no. well not, so, not yet. Well, I have an idea of it but I'm not going to speculate yeah. I mean too much I, 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 I did read some spoilers at some point so I get the, the thing but I'm not yeah look, look, I, I will just for people who are listening leave it at the hint of uh, those models during the encounter that's not the only use for them and it was really cool so yeah um right well uh are we getting close on time so do we have yeah. any final thoughts before wrapping up anything last points people wanted to cover um well i'll say briefly i thought yes yes uh, i i still need to say something which yes. goes into preparing your first let's say long session or second long mm -hmm. session depending atnas is so much better without the tentacles the yeah. model yeah, the model. You, you don't want the sack jellyfish to have its tendrils. Exactly. No. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, I Fair mean, enough. that's less stuff going on. And the, and the croc models actually is a mess to play on the table because it always has his muzzle like on the head of a survivor. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, it was actually eating. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the models are gorgeous, um, and the, but there are obviously a few. Uh, in, should we call them eccentricities when you're playing with them on the showdown board? Like, do not pick the oh, thing up except by their base yeah. and the croc cl yeah. colliding with things. Yeah, it it is what it is. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, that's that's from things like uh the my one of my um death um you know death king armor models is 
holding the spear and she's just the spear sticks out over an entire extra square in front of her uh. um, so, yeah like, like yeah it's not too thick but she does have to be rotated a little bit to make her fit on the board um but Makes yeah sense. Uh, so uh for myself i'm gonna say i think the gambler's chest i don't think this was the right kickstarter for it um but i and there's a few minor quibbles i have on like some of the miniatures I'm gonna, ha I've had to get replacements because the details on them were melted off. Um, with that's not really the, the fault of Adam Poot's games and everyone. That's just things happen in the factory. Um, I do think for anyone who has played a fair bit of Kingdom Death and they they are comfortable with what's going on, this is the step to go for. Um, it is worth the price tag that it has. It is a really impressive development of um, growth and maturity in the design. Um, we can see that the team has been play testing. They have been thinking about things. I really liked stuff like the Crimson Crocodile has that whole terrified mechanic, but the blood pool is there to allow you to manage it. And that textures the fight. I like, I, I like so many things about this. I think it's incredibly well done. And it is as long as they can keep putting things out now and give us a good, um, steady stream of new content, Kingdom Death is just going to go from strength to strength to strength. Yeah, well, apparently the Black Line is coming soon, so that's that's good news. And the Mini Squire uh, campaign! On, Woo! <laughs> <laughs> on a closing note, on my part, I really like the GC. I, as you as you said, I kind of think that it should have been uh, Kingdom Death 2 that was like its own core game uh, and a little bit better packed, but it feels so much more uh, polished than the base game. It feels incredibly well thought through. It's, it's just a little bit too much uh, bookkeeping and, and maybe a little bit too much complexity, but that uh, that's maybe the, the payoff of having a, an advanced version. And there's a couple of mechanics that I, I'm not really fond of, like the, the scouts and the encounters, but overall it's it feels, uh, it's the best that KDM has ever been. And uh, the next content is only going to push that further with, with COD bringing uh, back old expansion into the new version. So I really love it. Yeah, you've made me think of one more point I wanted to get across, um, which I'm disappointed that we did not get indomitable resources for the White Lion and Screaming Antelope. Um, I oh, can yeah. only assume they're coming in campaigns of death, um, but it felt weird so. that we have armor sets and philosophies that reference those two animals, but they didn't round it out with the um, indom like three indomitable resources like they did with the Phoenix. Um, anyway, yeah. Audrey, uh, you get the final closing thoughts before we sign off. Yes, before I have to leave because I have a four-hour drive coming. Um, <laughs> yeah, f f f f final, uh, final worlds and GC. Yeah, I think it's very fun. Uh, I hate taking the booklets of the philosophies out out of the box because that's a mess. Um, I, I I love I love I love the croc friendship ended with Gorm. Now now croc is my new best friend. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think that the smoke singers are. I'm waiting to see the level 3, to be honest. Uh, they are fun, but I want to see more of them. Um, Atnas was fun, but we are going probably to talk about that in the next episode if I'm there. Else, I'm. it was just too fun. Um, and I just can't wait uh, for Alexis to come back so we play more and get to uh, fighting the hand. That's the end first, right? Not that yeah. hand. Yeah, fighting yeah, yeah, the hands with all these different pieces of gear. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I, I want more, and we have a date scheduled, so that should come up uh, soon enough. Uh, Fantastic. We may probably, let's say, uh, decrease a little bit the speed uh, of the playtime because ten lantern this year, ten lantern years were a lot. We may aim at seven, eight um, next times. So we will see what comes, but yeah, that that has refreshed uh, my interest in KDM a lot. Um, but I'm still dreading the tens uh, years hole. Uh, so we are going to probably have, have Dragon King, 
And I would love to see the Dragon uh, King. I have, uh, I have never had the Dragon King as a quarry, so that's still going to be a discovery for me and all the Dragon King gear and stuff. Yeah, so I, I it's think a that's... really fun showdown. It's uh, you will enjoy it a great deal. Yeah. So so it's also going to be a way for me to rediscover some parts of the let's say f- former uh, content. So yeah. yeah. I only see mostly new stuff, uh, mostly exciting stuff uh, ahead uh, for my future in KDM. Uh, probably a few eh moments uh, when we fight the bonitors again or whatever. But uh, I see 85% of positive stuff. Yeah, Wonderful. okay. Well, that's, that's very positive uh, indeed. So uh, with that giggling, gurgling cry of the crimson crocodile, that means we all, our time's all out. We haven't got any left in this episode. Uh, this extra long episode uh, you can catch us on www.patreon forward slash the last standee or you can hear us on your preferred podcast app or, or via youtube so until next time we have been the last standee so it's goodbye from alexis from the rust ocean goodbye audrey uh, from the sacred pool because i remembered as well bye bye <laughs> and myself and remember that the second E in standee is for energy drop. Thank you.